Hi everyone, it's Gemma here today and welcome to this Neonates in a Nutshell teaching session on Neonatal CFM. So what is CFM? Well, it stands for Cerebral Function Monitoring. And to understand CFM, we need to talk just a little bit about EEG, which is electroencephalogram, which is used to record the electrical activity of the brain. CFM provides us with a time-compressed and filtered version of the EEG, which is sometimes referred to as Amplitude Integrated EEG, or you might see it written as AEEG. CFM uses less channels than traditional EEG, so less leads are applied to the head, um, and we can use it to record brain activity for prolonged periods of time. So if you think about the babies that we see on neonatal units with HIE that are cooled, they'll have CFM on for the majority or for the whole of that treatment, um, which is for a few days. So why do we use CFM? Well, brain cells communicate with each other using electrical signals. And this electrical signal is picked up by the EEG and is recorded as the wave patterns that we then see on the screen. There's different levels of consciousness and they're represented by different frequencies or waves per second. Um, and this alters the wave pattern that we see. So a good example of this is sleeping and waking. Um, so as you can see on the trace here on the slide, the wave pattern appears to be narrower in some places and wider in others. And this just reflects the sleep-wake cycle, which is normal and something that we want to see on our CFM traces. So CFM is used to help us detect abnormalities in the electrical signals and the wave patterns from the brain. So when do we use CFM? Well, CFM is used to support the assessment of encephalopathy, which is defined as damage or disease which affects the brain. It's useful for detecting um, and assessing the treatment of seizures. Um, and we also use it to support assessment of infants with HIE, helping us to determine the severity of the insult that they've had and is also useful for the assessment of the subsequent long-term outcome for those babies. CFM can also be useful for assessing infants with abnormal neurology associated with underlying conditions. So things like congenital brain malformation, um, inborn areas of metabolism, babies with severe hyperbilirubinemia, and particularly those who have had an abnormal neurological examination, infants with NAS um, and other babies suspected or having confirmed intracranial infections like meningitis. So we'll just talk quickly about HIE, which is hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Um, and this is probably one of the most common reasons that we use CFM on neonatal units. So what is HIE? So it occurs when an infant's brain doesn't receive enough blood or oxygen as a result of a sentinel event. So this might be something like, but is obviously not limited to, um, called prolapse, placental abruption, shoulder dystocia or a fetomaternal hemorrhage. Um, and basically, a lack of oxygen to brain cells results in anaerobic metabolism, which leads to cell death and then subsequent brain injury. So how do we apply CFM? So CFM can be applied using gel electrodes like ECG leads or disposable subdermal needle electrodes. And the leads are applied in an anterior, which means at the front um, or by parietal position. So those are basically um, placing the leads on the sides of the head um, and we do it according to the specific guidelines for the equipment that we're using. So some CFM equipment will want us to use three leads or others will ask us to use five um, and it just depends on the equipment as to what we'll use. So three leads will give us a single channel reading and five leads will give us a dual channel reading. So if we look at the pictures of the bottom of the slide here, you can see where those lead positions should be applied. So we need to take care when we're applying the needle electrodes to ensure the correct skin preparation and adequate lead position. Um, and we also want to minimise pain on insertion. So we should consider things like sucrose, particularly if a baby is active um, and hasn't had any other um, analgesia or sedation um, before we're putting the CFM on. We need to take care to prevent damage to surrounding equipment, like um, making a hole in the cooling mattress. Um, and we also want to make sure that the leads are well secured. So we use an adhesive solution for that, but we don't want to use too much of it because it's really hard to get off. 
Okay, so the CFM's on, and now we're going to think about how we interpret the trace or the reading that we get. And to do that, there's a number of things that we need to consider. So the first is impedance, which is basically telling us how reliable the trace is, and it measures the contact between the electrodes and the scalp. So loss of contact between the electrodes and scalp increases the risk of artefact and reduces the reliability of what we're seeing um, and whether or not we can believe that it's a true interpretation of the brain activity. We also need to consider the raw EEG trace. Um, so if we look at the picture here, that's the trace shown at the very bottom, which is a direct real-time recording um, before we've had the compression and filtering of the reading, which gives us our AEG or CFM trace. Um, and then again, we need to consider the AEG, which is our amplitude integrated EEG or our CFM. Um, and this is the EEG, so the raw EEG that's been compressed and filtered. So here we want to look at the wave amplitude, which is the span of the waves, wave, so how wide it looks. And we want to look for variability. OK, so thinking about amplitude... Um, we're going to think about what is normal um, and we need to look at the lower and upper margins to determine that. So a normal trace will have a lower margin of greater than 5 and an upper margin of greater than 10. A moderately abnormal trace will have a lower margin of less than 5 and an upper margin of greater than 10. So the lower margin drops but the upper margin remains normal. A severely abnormal trace will have a lower margin of less than 5 and an upper margin of less than 10. So everything has shifted downwards. Okay, so now we've got some of the terminology that you might hear people using when they're talking about CFM traces. So we've got continuous normal voltage, um, which is a normal trace, discontinuous normal voltage, which is abnormal, and then we've got the severely abnormal traces, so burst suppression, continuous low voltage, and a completely flat tracing. And we're now going to look at some examples of all of these. So continuous normal voltage is a normal trace. So we're going to look at the amplitude of the wave pattern and we can see that the lower margin is greater than 5 and the upper margin is greater than 10. So the lower margin is depicted by that orange line and the upper margin is the purple line. You can also see that the trace narrows and widens in places which indicates sleep-wake cycling. And as we talked about earlier, that's a normal um, thing to see and something we want to see. This trace um, shows a discontinuous normal voltage, which is moderately abnormal. So again, we need to assess the amplitude, and we can see that although the upper margin is greater than 10, again depicted by that purple line, um, the lower margin is less than 5, so it's dropped down, um, and the trace has a much wider appearance. Also note here that there's not really presence of sleep-wake cycling. The trace is much broader and wider the whole way along. So now a severely abnormal trace, and this one is referred to as burst suppression. So the upper and lower margins are both less than 5. So if you look at the trace here, you can see that there's a, a darker band of blue along the bottom. Um, that shows us the suppression of the trace. And then we've got these bursts, which reach up to about 25 microvolts in places. So you've got the suppression and then the burst, so a burst suppression pattern. And you can see on the raw EEG at the bottom as well that there's not an awful lot happening. Um, Continuous low, vo low voltage sorry, is another severely abnormal trace. The upper margin is less than 10, the lower margin is less than 5, um, and the EEG also shows minimal activity. So this is a flat trace. Again, this one is severely abnormal. Both the upper and lower margins are less than 5, and there's no variability in the trace either. There's occasional bursts, um, but the majority of these um, are less than 5 microvolts as well. And again, we need to assess the EEG to compare that, um, and that too is almost completely flat with no activity. OK, seizures now. So seizures can be clinical or subclinical. So subclinical basically means that they're not supported by the clinical signs that we would normally associate with a seizure. So things like arching, posturing, rhythmical movements, lip smacking. Um, they can also be right and left sided or they can be single sided and they may occur in isolation or they can be repetitive. 
So if seizure activity is continuous and lasts longer than 30 minutes, then we would refer to that as status epilepticus. So what do we want to look at on the CFM trace? How do the seizures appear there? So if we look at the trace here, we can see that the upper and lower margins both rise or spike up um, to a higher voltage. And the EEG trace, the raw EEG below, shows a rhythmical pattern as well, which corresponds with what we can see on the AEG or the CFM at the top. So a pattern like this is sometimes referred to as having a sawtooth appearance. So other things to consider when we're looking at CFM um, and particularly if the trace is abnormal, are things like the gestation of the baby. So infants who are born at less than 35 weeks may have a less reliable trace. Babies who are on morphine or who have had anticonvulsants because of seizures can have a suppression of the lower baseline, which will normalise um, as the medication wears off. And we can see an example of this um, in the trace shown on this slide. So this trace is moderately, moderately abnormal to start with. The lower margin is less than five. There's no sleep-wake cycling, and you can see spikes in the trace where both the upper and lower margin rise up, and these are seizures. Then there's a green marker which is labelled as point A, which shows us when the anticonvulsants were given. And then after that, notice that the lower margin drops further and we can see that the seizures stop. Um, scalp edema is another thing that might also cause suppression of our trace. So just remember, bear these things in mind when we're assessing a trace, particularly if it's abnormal. Artifacts. So artifacts are false readings that might cause elevations in the CFM trace and can be caused by impedance issues like loose electrodes um, or electrical interference from equipment. Um, things like if a baby's on high frequency oscillation and ventilation. They might be caused by handling or procedures, which is why it's really important that we remember to use markers on our CFM trace um, when we're handling a baby or when it's having a procedure or something else is going on. Um, and we can also get artefacts when we have ECG or pulse interference. In most cases, if we compare the um, CFM reading, so the AEG with the raw EEG, that will help us to determine whether or not the CFM reading is true or if the abnormal deviations are caused by an artefact. So we're going to look at some artefacts now. So this trace shows a high impedance. The trace is interrupted, the baseline's risen up, um, and essentially here we need to review our electrodes, possibly reposition them or resecure them or replace them. This time we can see electrical interference on the CFM trace. So the baseline rises up, and when we compare this to the raw EEG, um, it looks really unusual, which is suggestive of interference from equipment. So you might get this sort of picture if you've got a baby on high frequency. Again, looking at this trace, um, if the marker wasn't there, so that green line, um, you might think that the baby had had a seizure um, as the baseline rises at point A. So you can see the baseline and the upper limit have both risen up. Um, which we've talked about earlier as being indicative of a seizure. But when we then compare that with the raw EEG at the bottom, it doesn't correlate. So we can't see that spike or rhythmical pattern there. So this again just highlights the importance of adding markers for procedures and interventions. So CFM, our key points to remember, CFM is useful for assessing encephalopathy. Um, careful application of electrodes is required to support an accurate trace. We should consider factors that may result in suppression of the CFM trace, like morphine or anticonvulsants. We should consider factors that may result in elevation of the CFM trace, so artefacts, which we've talked about. And we should consider both the AEG, so our CFM, and our raw EEG traces when we're interpreting our CFM. And we need to remember to mark handling and procedures on the trace as well. So finally, if you want to go away and practice interpreting um, CFM traces, uh, these links are really useful. There's a, they're basically quizzes and they give you some answers afterwards so you can have a go at interpreting the traces for yourself. Um, and just remember, as ever, if you have any questions, feel free to ask any of the a and team. Thanks for watching.